let's uh, let's uh, pray for our children. Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift these young ladies to you. We pray, Father, your protection on them. We ask, Lord, that all the things that they go through in their lives, Lord, that you will be with them and watch over them and bless them. Lord, you have a plan for each child that is here. And Lord, we just pray that you would help them to discover that. You look into their little faces there. Lord, that uh, as they are following you, Lord, that you would give them strength to do so. Father, we ask that you would uh, make them, make them over, have a, have, a, have a heart for you, make them have a heart for you, to know that, that as they follow you, that you're going to bless them. As they give themselves to you, thing out back here. I can't find it. I'm just kidding. Let's pray for them. <laughs> I was going to have them pray for me, but I thought that would be fun. So I'm just going to. That's all right. Thank you. Jesus, my Lord, we thank you. Well, we're going to go to prayer. And as we do, uh, let me let me tell you about just a, a few things that have been going on. I'd love to uh, tell you about the praises uh, that are going on. State Stacy Gardner, pastor, Cosmetology State Boards. Praise the Lord. That's always wonderful to hear that kind of stuff. Uh, Paulette Usselton is out of the hospital, and she's breathing better. And if you know Paulette, that's a good thing, because she has a lot of problems with breathing. We also want to give the Lord praise for uh, Ricky Sexton, Jr., who's out of the hospital and uh, continuing to improve. We just continue to pray for his health and, and uh, strength. Uh, our prayer requests this morning, let me add just a few to this. If you'd like to write them on your prayer request, your, your uh, request list so you can keep track of who to pray for and how to pray. Um, the first is uh, uh, Daniel Ingram, and him and both Clarence called, and both of them are sick today, so we just need prayer. A lot of people out with, uh, a lot of people get bronchitis, and it's just that time of year, and uh, so we just need uh, an extra prayer for those ones. Um, and then also uh, there is uh, kind of a little change. Rick Deppen uh, is, uh, it says he's back in the hospital and the uh, hospice is called in. He is at Stein Hospice, but as Darren told me, he thinks he's in Willard because he doesn't want to go to Stein Hospice. And so just pray for this process. I've been in to see him a couple days over the past few weeks and, and uh, just continue to pray for him. Asked him the other day, I said, uh, Rick, I said, you know, there's one question I have for you before I pray for you. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And he said, Oh, yeah. In, how do you say, in, inside and out. And I said, Praise the Lord. And, you're, and I said, You know, whatever God decides to heal you or to take you, you're ready. Whatever. And uh, you can serve Him on earth and you can serve Him in heaven. So we continue to just pray for Rick. You can see the other ones on here. Um, Brian, uh, Brian's aunt Frances uh, has cancer in her spine. Uh, Paulette's mother, Mrs. Ruckman, has an upcoming surgery. Dale and Esther Gardner from Unspoken and uh, the Doug Grant family as he has passed. And uh, we need to pray for that family. Any other requests that we can add to our list today?
brought me a list, and it was so long. I said, Logan, I tell you what, why don't, why don't we just say, you already wrote these down, and God already knows what they are, and so we're going to pray for Logan's list, okay? Because we, I've been up here another hour, you know, and, and I praise the Lord for kids that pray, and because when they pray, they have real faith that God's going to take care of these things a lot of times. They pray a lot better than we do, so. But uh, we're going to pray for Logan's list today. Anybody else have a request? I've been sleeping too well here lately. Usually it's because I've been praying, but uh, I, I've got something wrong with my neck, and uh, I've uh, and it's yeah, I've got a pain in the neck, and it's not my wife. Hers is a little lower pain, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm gonna gonna be anointed. I'm gonna have James and Isaac and some of the people come and do that in a little bit. But anybody else would like to be anointed? have unspoken requests, and uh, if you would stand with me as we go to the throne of our Lord and represent you, please. Lord, I know nothing scares you. I know you're never surprised. you're a God who loves us so much that you're willing to do anything you can to keep us from going to a devil's hell. You're willing to stand in the way. You're willing to put people who are obedient in people's way so that they just don't continue to walk towards this total destruction that comes at the end of life if they don't accept you. gone as far as to send your only son to a cross, a terrible, terrible, awful punishment. And he died for us. He died in our place. He took our place. He took it, our sins on his shoulders and he is willing to pay. He has paid and, and, and was willing to pay for every single sin that man ever committed. All we need to do is accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Pretty simple stuff out very well. It's a wonderful plan. But God, we know that this world has blinders on their eyes. The Bible says that a veil covers the eyes of men and women so that they can't see the real truth. Lord, I, my prayer is, is that the, the veil would be removed so that the lights come on and people can see exactly where they stand when it comes to what's going to happen in eternity. I pray, Father, that uh, the, as the lights come on and, and that veil is removed, that people will know that the only way that eternity with you is possible is through Jesus Christ. It sounds crazy, but it's a great plan. It sounds like it's out there, but it's the only way. It sounds like a crutch, but when you're crippled, that's not bad. Lord, we need you. We need you desperately. And not just for a Savior. We need you as, a, as, as one who leads us and guides us and directs us in this world. So we'll walk your way. We need your strength and your power because without it, we're helpless and hopeless. We love you and we praise you. Lord, today we give you honor and glory and lift up the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's because of that strong name that can be saved and we can receive salvation and we will see you someday and we will greet you and you'll be the only one there who has scars on his body because you deserve that and that is your badge of honor and glory today Lord we come and ask on behalf of others 
and on behalf of ourselves. Today, Lord, we come and ask that you would, uh, you would heal the sick, that you would, you would touch those families that are grieving because of death, that you'd help those that have been given a death sentence, that life is nearly over. Lord, we know there's a beginning time and an ending time. pray that it would be saturated with your love and your strength. Lord, uh, we come as people with spiritual needs who know we need to get right with you. And Lord, turn our hearts, change our minds, move us closer to you. We come and step out from a world that is, is, is a world like it was in the days of Noah. plan for us and a direction for us as the church. You haven't given up. Your hand has never left the wheel. You've always been in control. And we need not worry and pray. Lord, today we lift those with spiritual needs to you. We lift those with physical needs to you. We pray, Father, that you would be with each and every one as they go through their time of trial. Lord, be with families lost jobs or getting laid off or are laid off or looking for work looking to figure out how the ends are going to meet Lord be with them help them to follow you and know that you are the answer even in that even in that area because when we turn our stewardship over to you when we turn our money gambling over to you that's when things get easy I pray Father that you would our prayers and our requests today. Lord, like Jody said a little while ago, families that need to come together, fences need to be mended, people need to say I'm sorry, and, and, and we, need to, we need to show that there's real love in family. Lord, I pray that uh, you would hear our requests. And we only bring them because you tell us to. Lord, I don't want to say, or I don't want to forget this, this whole idea that we're approaching Thanksgiving. It's the time of year when we stop everything and we say thank you because you have been there all year long. You have been there to heal the sick and, 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 and to, uh, uh, to save those who, who were uh, far away from you. Lord, you've pulled them in. And, and Lord, this is the time that we stop and we pray and we say, Lord, thank you you deserve all glory and honor because you are the Savior. You are the one who gives us strength in our bodies and gives us work and, and, and gives us a family and gives us life. You're the one who provides all good things. And we give you honor and glorify who you are. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. As we set around tables this Thanksgiving, as we feed homeless people, as we do the things that you called us to do, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified. That you would be truly thanked because of all that you've done. Because you're so deserving. We give you honor and glory. We lift up the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's in his strong name we pray these things. TVs off because they make noise behind me and you can't hear it but I can and I'm thinking it's bugs so I'm already out there uh, huh yes oh yeah I was ready to start preaching but yeah <laughs> yeah I uh, would like to uh, some of the guys if you'd like to be anointed today we're going to uh, just uh, you know take some time here and uh, take care of these uh, physical needs or spiritual needs, whatever you would like, um, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to come this morning and be anointed also. I've been having problems with that.
Well, I've been trying to finish a sermon series uh, for the last four weeks, I think, and every week God's messed it up. And so I, no, no, he is, definitely has a plan and a direction. It's, I preached this message, or kind of this message, it kind of took it and reformulated it and worked with it, and, um, uh, and it was God leading me to do this, and I didn't understand why. I, I really scratched my head. God, God, what are you doing? Why do, I, why do we need this now? What's, what's up with that? And, and, and God kept kind of just saying, well, just do it. Just take care. Just, just do this. And I, I think I've come to the understanding as to what is happening or what's going on. Um, you know, we, uh, <laughs> we just came, how, how many of you miss political ads? Anybody? Oh, I, look at you. Look at all the hands. <laughs> uh, we've just come through a, a very, very difficult election. But, but let me tell you this. No matter where you stand, what party, whatever, uh, you know, I, I encourage people to, to, to vote biblically, you know, to vote against abortion, to vote, vote against homosexuality, uh, you know, those real top issues that, that uh, we know the Bible stands against, and so we were going to vote that direction. And then when I uh, went to bed on uh, the, the night the election was taking place, and I, I went to bed and I'm thinking, okay, the candidate that, that is, uh, uh, stands for those things, or at least goes that direction, uh, looks like he's got a pretty good chance of winning, and went to bed, woke up the next morning, and realized biblical values did not get voted for. I, if, I, I struggled with that. God, we've prayed. God, we've asked. And, and, and I, I came to the conclusion that God did not lose an election. I, I talked to the board members about this the other night, and I've, I've kind of given hints out different places, but, but let me tell you something. God knows exactly what's happened. He, he, in fact, he's not reacting to it. He didn't go, oh, no. God doesn't have to do that because all, God already knew what was going to take place. God didn't lose an election. God, hopefully, preachers are telling their congregations this morning, God has put before us a real true vision of what our mission looks like. All these people who voted against biblical values, it was one of the highest things that people talked about all the time. But all these people out there voted against biblical values. Our mission field has now been put into perspective, and we know exactly what our job is as Christians. We know how we're to approach this. Because they outnumber us. Now, back in um, back at District Assembly, and I can't remember the guy's name who preached all week, uh, Manley, Stephen Manley. Stephen Manley did this. I loved it. He, he kept going like this. He would say, this is the world, and this is the kingdom of God. Okay? You can't expect the world to live like the kingdom of God. Here's the thing. Here's the world, and the kingdom of God is in the world. The world is not the kingdom of God. But the world uh, needs the kingdom of God. They need Christ in their lives. That's why we still live among them. Folks, we are the kingdom of God, and we represent God in this world. We're not of the world, but we are separated from the world, but we live in the world. And because of that, we have a mission that is before us. So I want you to know that we, did not, we didn't really lose an election, we just got God's will. And I know you scratch your head and say, huh? Why would God want these? Because when people are sinful, they go to the end of their sin. They go to the furthest end that sin will take them. 
And so many times, and it happened in my life, it's probably happened in your life, someplace along the line, at the, at the place that I was at the lowest, that's where God was able to reach me. That's where I was able to hear his voice, and that's why I got saved. So there's a whole bunch of people out there that us as the kingdom of God are responsible for reaching. This uh, sermon series that I've been preaching uh, really was based on a book called The Dip. Now the subtitle down here does not say the pastor, okay? The Dip is not the pastor, although I act like a dip sometimes. It is not about the pastor. It is about a process that everybody, I feel, goes through. We ask these questions, and so did Habakkuk. In the book of Habakkuk, if you've got your Bible today, turn to Habakkuk. You can look at chapter 1 for a little bit, but mostly we're going to be in chapter 3 today. Basically, Habakkuk asks the question to God, God, why don't you seem fair when all these bad things are taking place or happening? God told Habakkuk, he said, I'm going to send the Babylonians these mean, nasty, awful, cheating, no good, low down, dirty dog of a people. I'm going to send them into your country and I'm going to have them persecute you. They're going to come and they're going to kill you. They're going to take your crops. They're going to mess with everything that you have. And it's all because you're a sinful people. I'm going to have them come and do that. We get to chapter 2, and, and that's where Habakkuk says, But God, I object to this. How could you bring a people that are so, so awful and so mean to give us a punishment? How could you? I object. I will not stand for it. But since you're God, I believe you know what you're doing. How many of you believe God knows what he's doing? Does God fail anywhere? Did God lose, ele lose an election? No, we weren't voting on God. We were voting, voting on biblical principles. God did not lose an election. God knows exactly what's happening. God has a plan. He had a plan in Habakkuk's day. He has a plan today. He has a plan for his people, those who follow him, the kingdom of God. He has a plan for the world that some of those who live in the world and need to be in the kingdom of God see him, understand him, accept him, and follow him. That's his plan. Sometimes things have to get rough for those things to take place. We've got to suffer a little bit and sometimes a lot for people to come to know Christ. I used to say this. And I, and I would still say it today. I would pray this prayer for my kids. God, save them no matter what. Can you pray this prayer? Save them no matter what. I don't care if it, if it comes to giving me cancer, and that's what pulls them together. I don't care if it, it causes, it, it, that I have to die in some awful, terrible way. I don't care as long as my children accept Jesus Christ because eternity is much more important than this world. That's a tough prayer to pray. But when your belief is this strong, we've got to push for what God Desire, God's desire is. Romans chapter 13. Let's turn to Romans 13 real quick. It just come to my mind. Romans 13. I've got to find it here. I found this interesting for people who are, who are, uh, uh, are struggling with the issue here of what's been happening. Uh, Paul writes this to the, Rome, the, the church in Rome, and, and here's what he says in verse 1. He said, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been, have been established by God. Guess who put the president back in office? God was voting against us. No, God has a bigger plan. We just can't see it. We don't understand it. But God has a bigger plan. 
Okay, I'm going to get on with my, my stuff here with, with uh, Habakkuk. Uh, in, uh, in Habakkuk chapter 3, now, now let's talk about Habakkuk just for a minute. Let's give me, let me give you some history. Habakkuk was a temple musician. So a lot of the book of Habakkuk was written in this form of musical idea. Okay, people write music, they have musical notations, they have musical words that they use, tempo, uh, soprano, alto, they, they, they have all these different words. If you're not a music person, it, you may not understand. So I'm going to help you through with some of these words today. Habakkuk was uh, one of the 12 minor prophets. The book was written about 600 B.C., and it was a time when Israel had pretty much turned their back on God. They had walked away from God, and they were doing their own thing, and God was trying to bring them back. So he said, I'm going to have the Babylonians. He tells Habakkuk this. He said, I'm going to have the Babylonians come, and they will punish you. They will persecute you, and those people who go through difficulty will come running back to me. That was God's plan in a nutshell. And now we have here Habakkuk, the prophet. He, he, he not only was a temple musician, but he must have become a... Um, uh, a priest and so God began to use him and he became a prophet he began to speak for God God would give him the information he would speak to the people he's the one who said I do object God because you want the Babylonians to come and and to kill us all of the other prophets of God took the message to the people but Habakkuk was the only one who took the people's message back to God God we don't like this plan. Anybody ever done that? You ever do that to God? God, I don't like what's going on here. This is not fair. I don't know what you're doing, but it's not fair. It doesn't seem fair, God. I, I don't understand this. Habakkuk was the one who took that message back to God. Now, God told Habakkuk, tell the people that they were corrupt and the Babylonians were going to come and punish them. Now, let's, let's go to the next slide. My magic is gone. The dip. We talked about this book, The Dip. It's not based on this whole idea, but I've kind of taken it and used it this way. And we want to talk about it. It's written by Seth Godin, and we're talking about climbing out of the dip. How many of you have done this? Let me get my crazy little pointer here. I just wasn't ready for church today. I, I just got up late and moved slow and just wasn't ready for church, okay? Uh, the dip is this, this whole idea that, that we start here, someplace down in here with Christ. In fact, go to the next slide. I think that's going to help us. There it is. The, the dip starts down here. It's not double. So you're, it, well, it is double. You're not seeing double, okay? Uh, the dip starts down here. We run into Jesus Christ. And then we begin to live for him, and then we get to this place where everything is going great. The way I said it before was, um, uh, every time you turn the radio on, your favorite song is on. You go to the store, and you begin to pull into the parking lot, and, you're, and, and right in front of the door, there's somebody saying, hey, park here. Uh, everything it seems to be going right. You pray, you ask God, and it happens. You pray a prayer, God, I need this, I need that, all of a sudden, boom, it's there. But what happens over a period of time, and everybody who's been a Christian very long has gone through this process, you begin to uh, slide off that little mountain down the opposite direction, and you run into this place here called a crisis of belief. God, you were answering my prayers before, and now you're not, what is up with that? God, I get in the car, my favorite song is nowhere to be found. In fact, there's people cutting me off and waving at me with one finger. I go to the store to find a parking spot, and I've got to park clear in the back row. Nothing is going correct, nothing's going right. I even took it to this level. I said, there's people out there that, you ever, you ever notice there are people out there that do whatever they want, and they just get away with it, you know? You got, you got the, uh, the woman that goes from bed to bed to bed and gets pregnant and aborts the child. And, and then you got people out there that want kids and they can't have kids. And they do anything and they're praying and asking and pleading to God. 
Well, this is what we're talking about. These, we're, we're down in this dip. God, how can I believe you when I, I'm going through all these problems in my life? How can I follow a God who leads me to problems? I thought you were there to be my Savior and fix my problems. Next slide helps us a little bit. We begin to deny God, or we begin to deny that we're down in this dip. Anybody ever do that? <laughs> no, things aren't going wrong. Things are going really wonderful. I just slid off the hill just a little bit. And we try to go back to where we were. It doesn't work. You can't go back. You, get to a, you, you start thinking, I can, I can go back to where I, you know, the angels sang every time I you know, entered the room. Or you know, I, Anybody ever have that happen? It doesn't happen with me. You know? I hear a... <laughs> oh. Uh, anyway, the next one, go to the next slide. Some people give up. These are the three choices. They can either go back, they think they can go back, they can't go back. They give up. They say, well, I must not have been a Christian. This must have all just been a fantasy in my mind, and so I, I'm, I'm going to give up. I, God, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Because you're not answering my prayer. You're not going the way I want you to go. You're not the great Santa Claus in the sky. I've written those lists, and you're just not showing up on Christmas. And so we think we can go, we think we just get it over with and get out of there. The third thing we do, and let's see if that's what the slide is. Haha, okay. It's not. <laughs> I gave you this verse last week, just as a short mini filler sermon type thing to, to know you, you could pay me and have good faith, okay? Because God was taking over. I love this verse because it really talks about what we're going through. It talks about what, what's been happening. Now read this, read this with me, okay? Consider it pure joy. I don't hear you. Are you reading? Okay. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Stop. How many of you consider it joy when you face trials? No. We say, God, why am I going through these trials? I don't like this. It's no fun. Okay, that's what we do. All right, but we're supposed to consider it pure joy, not, not, not dirty joy, not unclean joy, pure joy. We con consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Okay, we're going to start because. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops what? Perseverance. What's perseverance? Somebody tell me. Perseverance means even though times get tough, we just keep on trudging. We keep on going because we know times are going to get tough, but we got to keep on going. God wants us to keep going. Let's keep going up here. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's go to the next slide. This is an exact picture, that verse is an exact picture of this diagram. And, and I'm going to read it while, while, I, while I take us through it. It says, consider it pure joy, okay, whenever you face trials, we start down the hill, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. You see the process there that you go through? Everybody has to go through the dip. It's, it's what tests you, it's what makes you into God's workmanship. It's what makes you mature and it's what makes you uh, be exactly who God wants you to be. It takes a little work. We're a work in progress. You could wear a sign that says under construction on you if you like. How many of you have ever had people say, well, you're a Christian, so you're supposed to act this way, but you don't? Anybody ever do that? Yeah. It's because I'm under construction. Okay? I'm under construction. I'm not fully completed yet. I don't have a roof. Okay, I don't have a basement, whatever. I, 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 I'm lacking somewhere. God is making me mature. He is making me into what I need to be for him. So we've got to be gentle when it comes to how we deal with other Christians. 
somebody says they're a Christian, but they do something you don't think is Christian, you've got to look at that person and say, they must be under construction. God's still working on them. God is still pouring the basement or, you know, roofing the house, whatever. He's still working. I'm still under construction. I'm your pastor. I still mess up. But God's still working on me. And it's a process of growth all the way through this. i got to keep moving. I'm going to run out of time. Let's, let's go back to uh, Habakkuk. Let's go back to Habakkuk chapter 3. We're going to get to the musical notation, okay? Uh, verse 3 or uh, chapter 3, verse 1, says this, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shini, Shig, Shiginoth. <laughs> Say that 40 times real fast. Uh, Shiginoth is a musical direction. It actually means, and I wrote this down, let me get it, let me get it. Here's what it says. It means a wild, passionate song with rapid changes of rhythm. That's what Shiginoff means, okay? So remember, Habakkuk, Habakkuk was a temple musician, so he knew the notation. A lot of this book is written in musical form. And so here he is, he is he's, he's talking to God, and he, he is, he's telling God, uh, you know, passionately, wildly, he's singing this song or prayer back to God. Let's keep going. Here's what he says in, in verse 2. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. O Lord, renew, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now the word renew sticks out to me in this process. Renew. And, it's, and, and, and the, the word renew in Hebrew is the word Kaya! Say kaya. kaya. Sounds like a karate term, doesn't it? Yeah. It means renew. God, renew me. So you can, you can say in your prayer, you'll be praying, God, kaya! And, you know, the neighbors will think you're crazy. Uh, people watching you, you know, it's really fun to do that at McDonald's. Uh, and then especially if you've cut your hamburger in half. Um, we're asking God to renew us or to make us new. And that's what was going on in this process with Habakkuk. He says, renew them in our day. O Lord, renew them in our day. Revive and restore us. Because we've been bad people. We haven't followed you the way we should. I can say that too. God, renew me, restore me. I haven't followed you the way I should. I mess up. But God, I fess up. I, I want you to know that, that I need you to, to help me to get me through this. Let's, let's take a look at this whole process. If you got your little uh, hand out there, we're going to talk about how we climb out of the dip. Because we've been in the dip for the last couple weeks. The elections, man, I tell you what, I was in the dip. God, I don't understand why you've let these things go this way. I don't understand this. But God says, hold on. In fact, what's, let, let me test your memory. What does Habakkuk's name mean? Anybody remember? To embrace, yeah? To embrace, to hold on to God. That's what Habakkuk was doing. He was holding on to God. He was embracing him. So as we climb out of the dip, number one, we need to remember what God has done. Let me tell you something. This is the thing we seem to forget the most. That God saved us. That God goes before us. That God helped us here. That God helped us there. And as soon as trouble starts up, we're ready to run the other direction. We're so afraid. Let me read Habakkuk 3.3. 3. Here's what it says. God came to Temen, uh, the, the Holy One from Mount Par uh, Param. I love these words. And then we have another musical notation. The, the, the notation is Selah. Selah is a, a pause with a pause, but thinking about what has you just said or what's to come. Okay, so he's giving God glory. Let me read it again. God came to, from to man, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. And he thinks. Then he goes on, he says, His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. 
Selah is really an exclamation point. It says, wow, how great is God? And here I am asking him questions. God, why have you done these things to me? See, God, in this time, had done so much for Israel. Before this time, God had done so much for Israel. What are some of the things that God did for Israel? Think about it. He, he brought them out of Egypt, clear back here, when there were slaves, and there were 12 plagues. And then, and then he just didn't bring them out of Egypt, but, he, but they were at the, the Red Sea, and their backs to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army's coming, and then God split the Red Sea, and they all walked across safely on dry land. And then as soon as they got across, Pharaoh's army started to cross, and the water just washed over them. Okay, that's what God has done. What else did God do? God gave them the law on Mount Sinai. God gave him direction and he began to move them. He put a pillar of fire at night in front of them so that they could follow and walk in the darkness. In the daytime, he put a cloud in front of them and he fed them man. He gave them food all the time. But yet they questioned God. And they're at this place with Habakkuk. They're questioning God. God, why is all this stuff going, going wrong? Why is all this stuff happening? Habakkuk 3, 4, and 6 uh, here's what Habakkuk says. He says, His splendor was like the sunrise. The rays flashed from his hand where, where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. I like this part. He looked and made the mountains tremble. Anybody ever have a parent that could look at you and you know you're going to die? I'm dead. <laughs> They look at, they give you that look, you know, and he's just like, oh, 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 here I go. Here's God in his power. God looked. He looked. And I got to get back to my verse. He, <laughs> he looked and the, and the nations trembled. <laughs> I remember my, my grandpa. He could look at you and you just like, okay, all the bad things I've ever done. <laughs> here they are. I'm, I'm done. Go on. It says, the ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed, collapsed. His ways are eternal. Now, verses 7 through 15, I'll let you just kind of read on your own, but I'm going to kind of skip a few verses down. But, but here's the thing. We always seem to forget what God has done for us. God has done so much wonderful things. For you and your family. He's kept his hand on you. He's kept you safe. He's kept you from sickness. He, he's, he's done all these things. He's done things you don't even know about. Because he is God and he loves us so much. Let me tell you what God has done for me. I remember. I remember when I was, I was planning to go to Israel with my son. And, and we had this plan and we paid all this money. And, and I put a dishwasher in for a lady. And all of a sudden I've got a disc out in my back. The doctors tried to treat me with medication and everything. It just made me sick. I was in terrible pain. I walked around like this. I couldn't stand up. Two days away I have to go to Israel. I've got to ride a plane 24 hours set in airports, have layovers and everything, and go to Israel with all this pain in my back. I couldn't even bend over and put my own shoes and socks on. I don't know what I was going to do. The doctor says, you need surgery. I said, I can't have surgery. I, I'm going to Israel. He said, you're not going to Israel. You have to have surgery. I said, no. So it came down to the, to the night before. We drove down to, to uh, Columbus, and we stayed at a motel overnight because we had a real early flight that next morning. Before we went to bed that night, I'm standing here like this. I've got this disc out in my back. It's, um, I, I've been in pain all the time. And we gathered and we, we held hands and we prayed. And then we went to bed. The next morning, I got up out of bed. I put my own socks and shoes. I took a shower, put my own socks and shoes on. Because I told my son, I said, now if you know if I go to Israel with this bad back, you've got to dress me. 
And so he prayed extra hard. Uh, I got up that next morning, I'm telling you, it, and you know what? I've never had a problem with it since. I remember what God did. I remember that when, when Sheila was diagnosed with MS and, and she woke up one morning and it's like somebody drew a line down the middle of her body and half her body was completely numb. She couldn't tell if her foot was on the floor. She could stick her hand in the oven and touch hot stuff and it would be burning her and she wouldn't even know she was being burned. 18 plus years, God has healed her over and over and over just to be able to do His will. I remember the things that God has done. And so when we're in the dip, when we're climbing out, when we're hanging on to God, we've got to remember what God has done for us. That he saved me from a life of crap. And that's all it was. And it was going to get crappier if I didn't turn and follow him. He saved me and I remember. And he brought me out of junk and trash and garbage because God loves me so much. I remember when God called me. I'm, I prayed all night long. Okay, God, I know you want me to do something. I don't know what it is. And I'm standing in my kitchen. I'd work third shift security. I'd been in college. And I'm third, working third shift. And I'm, everybody left to, to go to work and to go to school, the kids and Sheila. And I'm standing, looking out my back window. And I said, God, if you want me, I know you've been, you've been chiseling away at me. You've been telling me this, but if you really want me to be a preacher, if you want me to go into this occupation and do this and follow this, then you're going to have to give me a visual sign. And I'm standing there and looking out. It's a spring, day, spring morning. This little bird comes up and flies right onto the edge of the window seal. And you know how usually a bird will fly up to the window seal and they'll, They'll stop there and then they'll turn around and they'll look out, you know, away from the, the house. This bird couldn't see his reflection because the screen was there. The window was up. And the bird came and he flew and he looked right at me through the screen. And if he'd have spoke to me, I'd have fell over dead, okay? But in my head, God spoke to me and he says, if I can use this little bird to tell you that I need you as a pastor, to preach my, my message, my gospel, if I can tell this bird to do that, if I can use this bird to give you a visual sign, how much more can I use you? I remember. And I don't quit. I've had a lot of opportunities to quit, and a lot of times I want to throw my hands up and stop. But you know what keeps me here? I remember. Because God is real and he's true. And guess what? You can think of things too that God has done in your life. We remember and we hold on to him. When things get tough, we got to hold on to him. Number two, we accept what God is doing. Oh. <laughs> uh, o ba o ba o Babylonians. No, that's Oba. No, ba yeah, anyway. Uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be that way. I'm supposed to respect those who are in authority, and I do. And I will pray for our president. But I don't feel like he's going the right way. In fact, I think he's leading our country the wrong way. That's the way I feel. But I will respect him, and I'll pray. And I'll accept that, and I'll pray for him. And I'll pray for our country every day. I don't like it, but I will pray that he follows God, that he accepts Jesus Christ, that he goes and moves the country in the right direction. Maybe that was God's intention all the time. All along, it could be it. I'll accept what God is doing. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 says this, I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. That was just me after I heard the news of the election. Because, but then I thought, why am I putting so much faith in the man anyway? Folks, the President of the United States is not going to save us. Only Jesus Christ is going to save us. He's the Savior. <laughs> I don't have to put my faith in, 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 in the government system. I don't have to. Because even though I live in this world, I live in the kingdom of God, and it has a whole lot of set of different rules. And I follow by those rules. 
I live within this, this country in the kingdom of God because I follow him. I don't have to follow the other things because those other things help me to follow uh, the laws of the land anyway. I don't like it. I don't like it, but I trust God. And sometimes God does things we just don't understand. Praise his name. Number three, we trust what he will do. In Habakkuk 17, 3, 17 and 18, it says, Yet I will wait patiently. <laughs> That's the hard part. I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Someday those people who are making us pay for abortions, someday those people who are uh, taxing us like crazy and trying to take away all the things that we think we need, Someday all those people are going to pay. If they're following Satan, they're going to pay. It's not up to us to make them pay. It's up to God. He keeps on going. He says, um, though the fig trees do not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the feeds produce no, produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen or cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God, my Savior. That's what we need to do. When there's nothing to rejoice about, God, I will trust you. I don't like it, but I will trust God. And even though I don't understand how God can fix me, how he can grow me up, mature me, how he can sanctify me and make me a holy person in his, in his image. And I, I don't understand that. I don't know how he does it, but I know he can because he says he will. The sovereign Lord is my strength, Habakkuk chapter 319. The, so the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. I like this. The next slide is going to help us understand that. Where are we going? Hang on. Trust him. Mature in him. Get that closeness and that intimacy with God and hold on to him. And I'll tell you what, he will take us on the heights. You'll be back on the mountaintop before you know it, but probably another dip is on its way. But it's only to make us better. It's only to make us and remake us into his image. It's only to renew us and make us into what he wants us to be in serving him. Praise his name. Would you stand with me? Well, now's the time to do it, brother. Go ahead. Accept what God is doing. 